Welcome. So glad you're here. I'm going to be continuing our series that we started last week. Uh, Tony started this series last week, and you know, I think a lot of churches or a lot of places, when they, they kind of step into the new year, they're going to do series that are maybe revolved around goal setting or things of that nature. But what we're going to do is we're going to actually talk about prayer this morning. And Tony, again, kicked off this series this week because we believe that prayer is an essential part of the Christian life. And I want to kind of recap for those of you who weren't able to make it here last week, uh, kind of the centrality of Tony's message to kind of bring us up to speed on some things. And the key focus that Tony focused on last week was that the childlike faith is the key to effective prayer. That as adults, we begin to question, you know, God's ability to provide for us and to meet our needs. But God's desire for us is to live a life that is fully engaged with him. And that, that, that prayer isn't just a one-time thing. That we are, it's an everyday part of our lives. And, and, and Tony also talked about how a lot of our mentality towards prayer is transactional. You know, we're going to just come to God when we need something, exchange a little bit of our time for him, and then get something back from him instead of just letting it incorporate every part of our lives. And so that brings us kind of up to speed today with what we're going to be looking at. And as we start out, I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to have the question, why do so many of us struggle to pray? And I think it's because we compartmentalize our lives. And, and the way that I would, would kind of, the analogy I would use for this, if any of you know what this is here on the next slide. And this is a TV dinner. TV dinners, I didn't even know actually if they still made many of these TV dinners. Uh, I had to look actually when I was at the store this week to see if they were still selling these. They still are in a very small section in the store. But uh, I grew up on these things. You had your mystery meat at the bottom. You had your plastic green beans at the top. The mashed potatoes, which were actually pretty yummy. And then the thing in the top middle they claimed were brownies. But they kind of tasted funky sometimes so um, but there there are oftentimes when you would find TV dinners you would find that they were compartmentalized their foods and I remember there were sometimes I would open my TV dinner and I would see a piece of my food got into the other compartment I had to hurry and get the green bean over back into its category out of the mashed potatoes right and so what I think for many of us as believers if you're a believer here in the room today, is that we tend to compartmentalize our lives often like a TV dinner, you know, our work life, our prayer life, our church life. We often separate them out into distinct areas of our life instead of having prayer and these areas weave all together in our lives. And I just want to emphasize today that, you know, God doesn't just want to be a part of your day. He doesn't just want to be five minutes of prayer in the morning. Okay, good, God, we good. Okay, I'll see you same time, same place tomorrow morning. But instead, he wants to be every part of your life. He is your life. And he promises us, we see a promise here in Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Prayer is a way that we live. Yet how many of us often neglect prayer in our lives? And I want to really emphasize today that prayer is the most essential part of the Christian life absolutely is the truth of God's word and the truths that it breathes through us absolutely important in our lives. But prayer is so essential because it so connects us with God and his heart and desire for us. I love the way that Martin Luther puts it. He says, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Prayer is the number one way that we communicate with God that we're able to grow in our understanding and our knowledge and presence of who he is. And I just, you know, if I can use kind of an example, you know, think about if, if you're married in the room or if you've got some friends in the room. How do we develop a relationship with those people? Well, it's because we talk to them. We get to meet with them. We get to see what, what makes them tick. We get to learn about them. You know, and oftentimes we see unhealthy marriages are unhealthy because there's not communication there. There's not time spent together. Same thing with friendships. And it's the same way in our relationship with God that if we don't talk to God, how are we supposed to have any clue about anything that he really has for our lives? And so what's God's desire for our prayer life, our posture of prayer? And uh, it's, it's in, we find this in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, and I've got uh, multiple versions up here just in case one doesn't quite resonate with you um, or make sense. Never stop praying. 
Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. God's desire is that we pursue prayer in our lives. You know, this used to make me feel so guilty because I would read I would read this exact scripture and I would think about how many times in my own life that I would, I would pray to God and then all of a sudden I'd find myself the next week praying. I'd look back and a week had gone by and I, didn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't consistent in prioritizing my prayers with him. Instead, I was just going to him more of that transactional mindset. But I'd like to emphasize that he's only a prayer away. We don't have to worry. We don't have to wait on God. We don't have to wait to talk to God. In the middle of my message today, I won't hold it against you. If you feel the need to pray to God, if you pray out loud, it might distract me a little bit. But, but you can tap into the, through the power of the Holy Spirit at any moment to talk to God right where you are at. And I was thinking about a good example that illustrates this well, kind of the opposite really. Um, and I uh, actually, I grew up with one of these. Uh, well, I grew up, my grandmother had one of these. How many of you know what this is right here? Okay, I've got the, uh, the, uh, the Gen X and Boomers attention in the room um, and up. Um, but also, uh, I recognize this because I grew up and my grandmother owned a rotary phone that I think belonged to her mom. And this, uh, for those of you who don't know, yes, it is called a rotary phone. Uh, they since updated the technology, and now you have something right in your pocket for this. But with a rotary phone, or with any kind of landline phone, you had to literally, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you had to go home. Like, if, you're think- if I'm thinking about one of you guys today, I can't just text you up and say, hey, do you want to meet for lunch? I've got to drive home. I've got to get and pick up my line. I've got to then start dialing your number, and how you dial it is you've got to... All the way around, if you're, if you're up in the zeros, that's going to take a little bit longer. Go there. But if you mess up, heaven forbid, because then you've got to hang up and start all over again, okay? <laughs> Fortunately, with the invention of the voicemail, you were able to leave a, a voice message and then get back to it and communicate that way. But it was like that's where the idea of the phone tag comes from because we had, you had to go out of your way to talk to somebody where really, if we're going to use an, a similar analogy, our smartphones, as, as much trouble as they've brought over the years, our smartphones, in a way, the access to God is in the same way. He is, he is through the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can tap into God at any time through prayer. We don't have to wait to go home. We don't have to wait to, to dial our rotary number and then mess up and then try again. He's always accessible for us. We don't have to go out of our way for him. So prayer is acknowledging God's presence and aligning our will with his and getting in sync with him. And, and, and the theme of my message today is that we can begin to incorporate rhythms of prayer into our lives as we recognize that we don't have to compartmentalize each of these parts of our lives, but let it be woven throughout every part of our day. And you can see here up on the screen behind me, and this is called an EKG rhythm. This is, uh, this is actually a normal sinus rhythm is what this is called. Before I knew uh, that God was calling me into full-time ministry, I actually uh, interned at IU West in the cardiac rehab department when I thought I was going to be going in more of the medical field of things. And so I got to learn a little bit about heart rates and heartbeats and how they work. And this is called a normal sinus rhythm. And this is what a typical healthy heart will look like. And, and whenever you're having, a, whenever there's a heart attack or some other kind of issue, I'm sure there's, I know there's doctors or nurses in the room, you're going to know way more about this than I am. But one thing that I learned during my time there was that there is, this is what a normal heartbeat looks like. And in the same way, if we think about how our prayers, prayer life should look, that it should be synonymous with a healthy heartbeat. Our, prayers should, our prayer life should be consistent. It should be healthy. There are going to be some flutters. There are going to be some things that, that act up and mess up every now and then in our lives. But it should be consistent and going. And just as we, we live and breathe, that prayer, we have to recognize, should be in sync with our life as well. And so as our hearts beat here in this room this morning, that our prayer life should so be in sync with that as well. It doesn't stop. It is strong and it's healthy. And so today we're going to look at the life of a man named Daniel, someone who exuded prayer in his life. So we're going to start today in chapter 6, but I want to catch you up to speed. I have this phone up here and it keeps distracting me, but I just feel like I'm ready to wait for a phone call at any moment. (laughs) But but I like it, so I'm going to keep it here. So we're going to start in chapter 6 today 
But I want to catch you up to speed on kind of what's happening in Daniel's life during this time. And so the story that we're going to read is going to be a familiar one. But to catch you up to speed, during this time, we see the current rule of King Darius the Mede. And he has pen-picked Daniel and two other men to supervise under his rule. And Daniel was excelling above all of their abilities. And so what happened naturally, they became jealous of him, right? Maybe think about your own life when you're at work and, and maybe somebody that you've interacted with at work is, you've had some difficulties with because they've been jealous of maybe a position or some authority that you've been given. It's the same way here. And so Daniel was excelling above them. And so they knew, though, that there wasn't, they couldn't find any fault in his performance or his abilities. And so the scriptures say that he was always faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. And you can see it up here on the screen behind me, but I'm going to go ahead and read it with you. In Daniel 6, 5 through 9, it says, So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for, for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, King Darius, your majesty, will be thrown into the of lions and now your majesty issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked so King Darius signed the law it says but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem he prayed three times a day just as he had always done to give thanks to his God. Daniel had a rhythm of prayer. Daniel already had been incorporating prayer into every part of his life and every part of his being. He wasn't just coming to God when he was at risk of losing his life. It was already a natural part of his life. He knew that he could look to God in the midst of hardship. We see what happens next in verse 13. Then they told the king, that man Daniel... One of the captives from Judah is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together, and the king said, Your majesty, you know that, every, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. So we actually see here that the king actually doesn't have qualms with Daniel. He actually likes Daniel. However, he knows that a law has been put into place that he must see to be fulfilled. So what happens next? Very, very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. He was so concerned with Daniel. It actually says in the prior verses that he just stayed up all night because he could not sleep. He was so concerned that he had sentenced an innocent man. To death. It says, very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouths so that they could not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him. For he had trusted in his God. Sometimes God doesn't want to take us away from our problems. But he wants to show us his strength in the midst of our problems. You know, God could have made a way of escape for Daniel long before his life was threatened up until the mouths of those lions. But in that moment, his faith was tested, and Daniel knew that because he had been so in touch with God and in tune with God in those times set apart with him, three times a day, probably more, that he knew that he could fully rely on God to get him through whatever his purpose is and whatever his will was. And so think about in your own, time, in your own life a time where you have also encountered a similar situation. Maybe it's a difficult situation that you've been through, something that, that you have really been faced to rely on God. I was thinking about a, a story in my own life that has really been, really been dear to my heart. And uh, Lauren and I, my wife, we, uh, some friends of ours, they have been a num uh, friends of, in our lives for a number of years. And they have a three -year, now three-year-old daughter. And they, uh, a little over a year ago, they uh, were due to have a, a son. 
They carried him to full term, only to lose him. And they had faith enough to try again. And so they have had a son who, again, she's carrying to full term. And they were here recently, actually just before Christmas, there was a little bit of complications that were starting to happen. And so in that moment, myself and other friends of theirs rallied around and began to pray. And I just remember getting down on my knees and just praying to myself. I just prayed to God. I said, God, will you just give me an answer of what, what has to happen? Like, because I, I, I just, my heart so broke and felt for them. And I cried out to God. I just said, God, what, can you give me an answer? And I, I heard so clearly he said, he is going to be healthy. And from that moment, I told Lauren and I told myself, I know everything within me that this is God. And from that moment within me, I knew that he was going to be born healthy. But in that moment, though, I didn't have, I had the faith to tell my wife and I had the faith to tell myself that, but I didn't have the faith to tell them. I didn't have the faith to go to them and say, hey, your boy's going to be born healthy. I was actually just talking to Tony this week and he was telling me a time where he actually was faithful. Maybe it's a few more years in ministry or something. But, uh, but uh, Tony, when Alex, your daughter Kinsley, was being born and she was having a lot of health complications and, and Tony remembered a time where he had prayed a similar prayer and he, he says he doesn't really fully remember this, but you do, that from that moment that he declared she's going to be healthy, she began on the uptick and she began to get healthy. Tony in that moment had the faith to tell Alex boldly what God had declared. And that's my desire, as I hope it is for yours, that whenever you come to God in prayer, when you're faced with the, the mouths of lions, that our prayers can be so, so believing in God that they're unwavering. Daniel believed in God, and how many of us believe in our God as well? And we're going to look at Daniel's past to see that he didn't just have an easy past as well. I think it can be easy for some of us to read these stories in Scripture and say, well, this person that I'm reading about their account, they had it easy. There was, you know, it, was, it was easy for Daniel to pray to God. It was easy for Daniel to encounter God in his presence because he just, he was, I mean, he's living in a, in a, in a palace, basically. But we're actually going to see that Daniel didn't have the easiest of growings up. So the book of Daniel covers roughly 70 years that Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, was exiled in Babylon. And this began when King Nebuchadnezzar laid, laid siege. And he took Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, also known as these guys. Some of you may recognize them. Rakshak and Benny. And he took them and he stripped them from their home, pressured them to give up their Jewish identity, Give, gave them new Babylonian names, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he put them through a training program in the literature and the ways of Babylon, which further solidified them in that culture. So there was no going back for Daniel. Just imagine, one of you as you are sitting here today, you love your family, you love your friends. Imagine somebody runs in that door back there, they come and they snatch you up and take you away, and they fly you somewhere you have no idea where you're going, and there's no looking back. And that's what happened in Daniel's life. But even though Daniel lived as an exile away from what he originally had known as a young man, his life had been filled with a lot of upset, yet he still was unwavering in his faith with the Lord. Daniel, even so much stuck by his convictions, that we actually saw when he was younger, that, that, that his convictions of what he should eat and what he should drink, he didn't compromise those. And God honored and God blessed that. And God actually began to use that faithfulness to bring Daniel up in a position of high power within God's kingdom and that kingdom of Babylon. So again, going back to last week, you know, Tony spoke on our approach to prayer with the faith of a child, having childlike faith and dependency on God. And I would say for many of us, how many of us would say that, you know, do we truly believe in God and what he can do for us? Or how many of us, instead of, instead of relying on God with every beat of our heart, every rhythm of our life, that we, again, have compartmentalized our, our prayer life aside from everything else, and we're only dipping into it when we feel that we need it. And so I want to refer back to that EKG that we talked about earlier. So just like an EKG can reflect the condition of a heart and how healthy our walk is as a believer, if we were to look at your prayer life, I believe that is a similar 
way to gauge your relationship with God. And I don't have this as a slide, but it is a very, very important point for you today. And that's if you don't have a healthy prayer life, you probably don't have a very healthy relationship with God. This was a fact that really hit me hard over the last year or so. Think about today. If you were to gauge where your relationship with God is, you can come in these doors and you can declare God with your whole heart during worship. You can declare that God is the King and the Lord of all. But do you really have the relationship with Him? And will you know whether or not you have that relationship, that real deep relationship with Him, if you are spending time in prayer with Him? And so, just like, again, a heartbeat has a rhythm to it, our prayer life should as well. And so there's a couple of components that I want to mention today that I think are very important to incorporate into our lives, into our life of prayer, that I think will help set the course as we move forward into the coming weeks and we look more throughout this series and you just grow in your relationship with the Lord. The first thing that I believe is of vast importance is that we pray in humility. We see this simply expressed in the posture of Jesus before his death, And he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. If we can be real, in this moment, Jesus didn't want to die for you all. But he knew it was the will of the Father for him to die for you. And because he was so aligned with his Father, he knew that it was God's will that was great. And that caused Jesus to go to the cross and to die for your sins because he knew, because it was the will of the Father, that it must happen. He humbled himself. He humbled his will to his Father's will. So what in your life do you need to lay down at the feet of Jesus? Before we even approach prayer, we have to come to God humbly, and there are things in our life that separate us from God. The Scriptures tell us that our sin separates us from God. Actually, in in Isaiah 59... 1 through 2 says this, Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. But here's the wonderful thing because of what I just mentioned, what Christ did for us. We see in Colossians 1, 20 through 22, it says, And through him, through Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God, you who were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Jesus Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Jesus has made you whole in the eyes of the Father. He has forgiven you. He has redeemed you. Prayer is what connects us to the heart of God. And when we recognize, we do recognize that our sin separates us from God. I know that the times that I am most out of touch with my prayer life is when I feel embarrassed and ashamed of something maybe that I have done, a way that I've treated someone, something that I have done just an action that I've had, that it makes me embarrassed to come to God. But God's saying, come, confess these to me because it shows your heart of repentance towards that that you were caught up in. So sin, I often hear people say, well, I can't hear God speak to me. I can't hear him talk. I would maybe wager to say that some of the reason you're not hearing him talk is because you're unwilling to give to him what you're clinging on to. So are we willing to lay down our pride? Are we willing to lay down the things that we have so muddied our lives with to give over to him as we step into prayer? And I would wager to say that that's how Daniel's posture was, that Daniel, I'm sure he's a human, that he had negative thoughts towards these people that were wronging him. But he also was so aligned with the heart of the Father as well. So the second part that I believe is very essential in the life of a believer and to incorporate these rhythms in our lives is to pray in quiet. In the scriptures, you know, we saw that Daniel got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed. He went off by himself. And we see, too, that Jesus himself had rhythms of prayer. There are three scriptures here that I brought this morning that you can see behind me here. It's that Jesus gets and he goes off and he prays by himself. Jesus knew the importance of getting with his Father in quiet to loud, more clearly hear his voice 
and to be in his presence. When we retreat to a quiet place with our Heavenly Father, we can hear him more clearly sometimes. Just like if this is, if we're, we're, we're just super loud, you guys maybe are at a sports game. I know the Colts game was just last night. We won't talk about it, but <laughs> it was last night, and there's a lot of noise, right? I would wager to say it's probably going to be harder for you to sit in the middle of a Colts game with people upset at what's happening and pray to the Lord, God, you know, Lord, please help them win, help them win, or whatever prayer you want to pray. Maybe you're praying for somebody else, something's going on. It's probably in that instance going to be a little harder to hear from him than it is if you go off to a quiet place. Scriptures say a secret place, a quiet place with him to hear from him. Because I believe that the fundamental purpose of prayer is to deepen our intimacy with God. And I think that can be why it can be so tough sometimes to just pray in general. Because some of us bring our own intimacy issues, we bring whether it's from our past, whether it's our present, but there are parts of ourselves that we don't want to expose. We don't want to open up to other humans, let alone to God. And I believe today God, for some of you, is calling you to a place of deeper intimacy and prayer with him. That for some of you, you haven't gone and prayed to God because you're afraid that he's going to expose some things in you that you need to work through. And he wants to do that with you today. So the question then is, can we allow ourselves to be open with God and to express the troubles and the heartaches and the troubles and the things that we're going through in our lives? I think the final part that's important to recognize as a, to, to incorporate into these rhythms of prayer is that we pray in community with each other. You all are here this morning because you know community matters. We mentioned King Nebuchadnezzar earlier, and actually back in chapter 2 we see, I'm going to kind of give you guys a little bit of a synopsis here, but King Nebuchadnezzar was having some disturbing dreams, and he wanted somebody to interpret them. He searched far and wide, all the wise men in the land, the people who claimed to be able to interpret things, and not one person could interpret his dreams. So as any good king would do, he ordered a decree to kill all of the wise men because he was upset that they couldn't interpret it. So Daniel, out of concern for his life and his friend's life, basically went to the king and he asked him to give him a little bit more time. Because Daniel knew that he needed to pray himself, but he also needed to include others as well. We see in, in chapters, or verse 16, it says, Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed in a vision to Daniel. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Sometimes we need the support of other people in prayer. I've been so, it was, it's been so encouraging. There's, there's different groups that I'm a part of here at the church. Uh, so our ministry team has one and, and people on Facebook and you request prayer from other people because you know that the power in community of prayer, the power with others can be even more effective than just you praying because sometimes we don't have the faith ourselves for something, but somebody else may. You know, we saw in the, we saw in the scripture with Jesus' healing that it was because of their friend's faith that they were healed. And sometimes we just have to admit that we need the assistance of others in our walk with God. And this is why church community is so important. That's why we so encourage you to come here on a Sunday morning, but not just that, to attend the groups when we have those up and going and, and just being a part of this community because we know the power of being with other people. Matthew 18, 19 through 20 says, I also tell you this, if two or two, uh, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For there, where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Community is important. Jesus knows that community is important. He surrounded himself with people in his life that could support him in his ministry here on earth. So the verse that I really want to emphasize kind of at the end here and, and really focusing on why we need to prioritize our prayers is this. Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. He says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. 
Ask God to give me the right word so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for the Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador, so pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. Notice something interesting about this scripture. Paul is not asking them to pray that he gets out of prison. I know if it were me, I'd be asking that. I don't want to be in prison and be in chains. I feel like I could serve God better outside of them. But Paul knew that the Lord's ways were better than his. That the Lord had a purpose still for him in prison as he wrote this letter. In chains, literally in chains. And so God, Paul so knew that that's what the heart of God was, just as, as our desire should also be in alignment with God's will as well. And Daniel knew this as well. And that's why Daniel, even up until facing his, his death, he still stayed devoted and committed to God the Father. So how often do you commit to praying? That's kind of my question for you here. You know, do you do it once a day, two times, three times? Do you do it once a month, once a year, if at all? Tony mentioned last week, you know, sometimes we as Christians can say, I, I, I'm praying for you. But the real statistic is maybe that percentage is closer to 25% than it is 100%. Instead of saying, how can I pray for you right now? How can I pray for you right now in this moment? Because I know that right now God has a purpose and a plan. This comes as we align our will with God and recognizing that it's his will that's better than our will. And I'll be honest to admit, there are some times that I pray a prayer and I see God heal and I see God answer my prayer the way I want it to, to go. But then there are other times that I pray a prayer and God doesn't answer it the way I want. And I have to know with everything in me and I have to trust and faith with him, aligning my heartbeat rhythm with his, that he has a greater purpose and a greater plan than I do. And I have to understand that, that God, I don't understand why this happened, but you do. And because of that, I can take security in knowing that you have my life in your hands. So if we don't recognize the importance of prayer and communion with God, we'll never do it. We can maybe have some hostility in us because God isn't answering our prayers the way we want. But are you willing to lay down your pride, lay down that in you that you're so mad at God for, and let him do a good work in your life? I think about like a car alignment. And I have, I've mentioned this before, but I have a 1998 Jeep Cherokee. Heard somebody say yes? Yeah, Maria, yeah. Yes, I love this car. Lauren wishes I would get rid of it and get a different car, but I love it. It has a lot, I have a lot of memories with it. But I, it is a 1998 Jeep Cherokee, and it has, a, it has over 350,000 miles on it. And through that process, I've changed pretty much everything but the transmission in that car. One of the things that I've done with it, though, is I have given it, taken it to the store and given it an alignment. You guys know what an alignment is with the car? If you were driving here on the way to church this morning and your car was pulling super far off the road, I'm just going to say now you need an alignment on your car because that's what does it. But I have taken my Jeep in a number of times to get it aligned. And they'll show me this, this they'll print out this sheet that'll have these statistics, this little stats on it that shows, okay, everything's in green, it's all aligned, you're good to go. In the same way, oftentimes our lives need an alignment check. We, and that's what happens through prayer. As we're praying consistently with our Father, He helps align our heart with His. If I'm getting a little bit too far off to the right in my own will, God, is this what you want? Okay, I'm coming back and I'm aligning back to center again. We shared this in our series where we talked about the I Am statements of Jesus. And John 15, 7 says, But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now, it could be easy for many of us to look at that and say, great, I want a brand new Maserati. God doesn't quite work that way. Because again, it's about aligning our will with his. Maybe someday his will is to grant us a Maserati or a nice Ferrari or whatever it is. But maybe God knows in that moment that what you needed was not a nice car, but maybe you needed to keep your old clinker car because at some point in your life, you're going to be able to bless somebody with that clinker car that needed a car, and then God will bless you with a new car that comes along the way. You just never know. 
God is just a prayer away. So as we abide in him, as the rhythms of our life so become one with him, we can know that he is our one true source and sufficient source of life. So don't just pray when it's convenient. Pray without ceasing. Pray every single moment that you get the urge to pray to God because I know that that is the spirit in you prompting you to reach out to him. So I'm going to ask as we end our time here together for the uh, worship team to make your way up. Before we get into our, our time of worship here together this morning, though, we're going we're gonna to do something just a little bit different. Because one of the things that I recognize this morning is that many of us bring in baggage. Many of us bring in issues and things that we have. And if I, could, if I could have you stand with me here this morning. I'm going to put my trusty phone away here. You'll use it later. <laughs> and this morning, I believe as I was praying for this message, I believe that there are people who are coming here this morning, who are, you are here this morning, and you have heard me preach on prayer, you have heard me talk about prayer, but you recognize that you cannot hear God. You feel you can, you, no matter everything in you, you cannot hear clearly from God. You hear friends of yours saying, I heard from God today, all this stuff, and you just, you're, you just feel like you've lost a connection with him. And so what we're going to do is Patrick kind of plays some keys in the background, and I'm going to ask the ministry team members to come forward. And even if you're not in our ministry team member, what we want you to do is this morning, if you're here this morning, and you would say that I'm having trouble connecting with God in prayer, that I, 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 I cannot hear his voice. I want to hear God better. Would you be courageous enough this morning to just, just raise your hand? Just raise your hand here this morning. This is a moment of courageousness. So this morning, for a couple minutes, while the music plays in the background, I'm going to ask that our ministry team members are going to go, and we want to pray for you this morning. Ministry team members as well, or if you're in here, I, I, we, we say this before, we're going to deputize you. Even if you feel like your connection with God, you can hear so clearly from God. Fantastic! Use that clarity from God to speak to somebody else. Maybe somebody didn't have the courage this morning to raise their hand. But God is highlighting somebody to you here this morning to pray for. Will you pray for that person this morning? And so we're going to take about three or four minutes here. And I just want to pray for those who have either raised their hands or for those that you're looking around the room and you're sensing that God has something that they want to speak from you to that person. And after we do that, uh, the ministry team members come back up front, and then I have some prompts on the side here, which you'll, you'll see here on the side. And I'll go through those with you, and we'll, we'll talk about what you'll do next. So we're just going to play some music in the background. This is that time where sometimes we have to embrace the uncomfortable. Sometimes it's not uncomfortable to just stand and, and feel awkward, like, you know, somebody's going to pray for me. What's happening? If you're real about this, you are here this morning because you want God, right? Then make it real. So we're going to take a few moments and do that, and then I'll come back up and lead us into our next time in, into worship.